What are some common facts that people believe to be true, even if the existing evidence states the contrary? Myth. The pool is definitely clean. It has such a strong chlorine smell. Fact. A strong chlorine-like smell, like the kind you associate with public pools, is actually an indication that the water is not chemically balanced. It might even be a sign that the pool needs more chlorine. Edit. Lots of people commenting about how this smell comes from pee. And yes, you're partly right. However, there's also ammonia in sweat, so it can contribute to the smell too. The source linked above actually explains chloramines and pool smell quite well. If you'd like to understand this phenomenon better, who are my time to shine? I used to test pool water slash hot tub water as a part-time job. This is what I learned from reading the material that the company gave me, but my advice always seemed to work, so I think it's pretty solid. There are two types of chlorine, free chlorine and combined chlorine. Free chlorine is generally odorless in the pool. It's the chlorine that can attack bacteria. Combined chlorine is chlorine that has already attacked some type of bacteria. All it just stays in the pool and doesn't do much. That combined chlorine can make your pool smell like chlorine or even make your pool cloudy. If a pool smells like chlorine, it has too much combined chlorine. To get rid of it, you need some type of oxidizer, like a calcium hypochlorite or something along those lines. So in other words, even if a pool smells horribly like chlorine, it can still be very unsanitary and unsafe to swim in. So combined chlorine is basically free chlorine after it has already been used to kill something. I take it that means that a pool full of free chlorine will eventually turn into combined chlorine as it kills stuff and there's a finite amount of germs the pool chlorine can kill before it needs to be replaced. That is correct. Not 100% sure on this next bit, but apparently some chlorine evaporates so not all free chlorine is used, but I would assume that number is negligible. But yes, just because the chlorine is used up doesn't mean the bacteria is out of the pool. That's why it's important to oxidize your pool weekly and have some type of consistent chlorine dispenser. Most people use chlorinating pucks aka trecla to replace any used up free chlorine. It's okay to have some combined chlorine in your pool. Anything below 0.2 parts per million ppm is generally acceptable, but when you start reaching 0.6 ppm, the pool starts getting cloudy and gross. A few people still believe that opening windows before a tornado to even the pressure will save their house from damage. Some also still believe trailer parks attract tornadoes and that random sacred landmarks can protect cities from tornadoes. The first part of that does have some merit though. Opening up all your windows will effectively reduce the total force being exerted on the walls from the outside, wind since some of that airflow is allowed to pass through the wall instead of acting upon it. However, considering how strong the winds are in a tornado, and how small most windows are, the effect may as well be irrelevant. Opening your windows to reduce the damage from the winds of a tornado is probably about as effective as planting shrubbery to reduce the damage from an oncoming avalanche. Lol yeah the standard answer is don't worry, the tornado will open them for you when the debris starts hitting the house. The dramatic pressure drop in the core of tornado would potentially cause issues in a house with no way to vent said pressure difference, but by the time it drops that low usually the roof has been blown off or windows broken by debris long beforehand. Main danger in opening windows is, if it delays the person opening them getting to shelter, they'll probably break anyway, but near a window is not a great place to be with a tornado bearing down. That Einstein was a bad student and was bad at math. It's just not true. He got average high marks and was really just disdainful of the structure of school. And he was good at math. Physics is like 90% math. I get why people share it, it's to make struggling students feel better about themselves, b 6 ut can't we tell them about something else instead of lying? Just show them the salary of a plumber or welder compared to their teacher's salary. That ought to cheer them up. Edit. Thanks for the award, and also I'm silencing notifications as I woke up to 50 replies this morning. Einstein's grades in school were very good, except for languages. That doesn't even mean much as his English was perfectly sufficient to live and teach in America later in his life. The confusion comes from the fact that Einstein was German, but went to a Swiss school. In Germany one is the best grade and six is the worst. 
In Switzerland it's the other way around. As Einstein was graded 6 in maths, that surprised many people expecting to look at a German report card. The most violent arguments I've had have been convincing patients with a viral cold that they don't need antibiotics. I remember a documentary a few years back about a GP's practice here in the UK. Basically filming patients with their permission to show a day today. They literally had people come in and answer what's the matter today with I need some antibiotics. They didn't even elaborate on why, just I need some antibiotics. You see, my rumored Dave always plays loud music at night when I'm trying to sleep. No one likes it. So I need some antibiotics. Preferably strong ones. My mom, she gets super depressed sometimes. I need antibiotics to cope with it. Cutting your facial hair makes it grow in thicker. I had a full-on argument with an individual who firmly believed that genetics played no possible role in hair growth whatsoever. I have never been more perplexed or angry in my entire life. Sincerely, bald at 25. I'm a master aesthetician and I've studied hair growth, and I can confirm, shaving slash waxing slash plucking does not make more hair grow thick and all or longer. The reason for this misconception is when you shave, it makes the tip of the hair blunt so when that protrudes from the follicle, it appears to be thicker. The only change in hair texture slash thickness slash length slash etc occurs in the papillae, hair root, which is completely determined by hormones. Edit, hey y'all. As much as I love talking about my field I got a turn in, but consider contacting a local aesthetician for your skin slash hair questions. People still think an undercover cop has to tell you they're a cop. How does that even make sense? Months of preparations ruined on the first day because someone happened to ask the magic question. Cops are allowed to lie to you and they will pretend to be your friend to get what they need from you. Side note, even if you're innocent of a crime, the first words from your mouth should be I want a lawyer and you don't provide any information until you have one. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. To your side note, the first and only words should be I want a lawyer. Always, no matter what they try to tell you. I've practiced law both as a defense attorney and a prosecutor and I have never once seen a person successfully talk their way out of something after being read their rights. Even if you're innocent, you're going to be stressed and not thinking correctly. What you mean to say will likely not come out exactly right, especially after a few hours of questioning. You'll likely contradict yourself at some point without realizing it, or even meaning to, or what you say can be taken completely out of context. Undercover cops can do drugs to show they aren't cops. Your heart stops when you sneeze. I mean have you seen my dad sneeze? No wonder the heart needs a break. Dad sneezes are a different game. Dads, I love sneezing. The sensation of it is just fucking amazing, and I get excited whenever I feel like I'm about to sneeze. That nose wiggle building up to the final nos explosion is just so fucking freeing, it's like I'm taking off a pair of tight jeans after a long day. Fucking facial orgasmic. I wish I could sneeze more. Sneezing is supposedly similar to an orgasm, but only one seventh, one tenth powerful. I can't imagine a dad orgasm then. Must be why they're dads. Your heart stops when you sneeze. I mean have you seen my dad sneeze? No wonder the heart needs a break. Dad sneezes are a different game. Dads, I love sneezing. The sensation of it is just fucking amazing. And I get excited whenever I feel like I'm about to sneeze. That nose wiggle building up to the final nos explosion is just so fucking freeing, it's like I'm taking off a pair of tight jeans after a long day. Fucking facial orgasmic. I wish I could sneeze more. Sneezing is supposedly similar to an orgasm, but only one seventh, one tenth powerful. I can't imagine a dad orgasm then. Must be why they're dads. A lot of people think they can burn belly fat by doing crunches or slim their arms down by doing push-ups, but targeted fat loss isn't possible, and there's no evidence to suggest it is. True. One analogy for this, I heard involves a pool of water and a bucket. If you take water out of the pool with the bucket, burning calories to burn fat, even if you scoop in one place it will remove water evenly across the pool. Some people's genetics store fat more in certain parts of the body and you can't spot reduced body fat. 
Yeah. Ab workouts just build up your core muscle and burn calories. The kitchen is where you lose the belly fat. Whoever is losing it, I'm finding it. Noted. Do abs in the kitchen. Alpha theory and dog training. The researcher that originally described the dominant theory was watching captive wolves at a zoo pack that was artificially created from unrelated specimens. The hierarchy in this curated collection was determined through fights and struggles for dominance and this dynamic was then applied to domestic dogs and how they view themselves in relation to humans. This drove the dominate your dog style of training popular with Cesar Millen and his acolytes. When the scientific community was able to observe a wild wolf pack, however, they discovered that wild packs are family units and operate much the same way with a parental breeding pair at the top and their younger offspring forming the pack, sometimes several litters at a time. As the pups grow older, they break off and form their own packs. The researcher that dismantled the theory, David Metch, described it thusly, attempting to apply information about the behavior of assemblages of unrelated captive wolves to the familial structure of natural packs has resulted in considerable confusion. Such an approach is analogous to trying to draw inferences about human family dynamics by studying humans in refugee camps. Also, dogs are not wolves. Unless you're living with a hybrid, anything that applies to a wolf will not automatically apply to a dog. Treating a dog like part of your family is way more effective. My dog never runs off, she genuinely likes to be with us, but I run away from my family and don't genuinely like being with them. TBF, studying wild wolves to get insight on pet dogs really isn't any closer than studying captive wolves. That's why you study feral domesticated dogs. So, I don't own a dog, yet, but I remember reading a dog training website saying, when walking your dog, never let it be in front of you. It has to be to your side, and slightly behind you at all times. If it's in front of you, it thinks it's the alpha, and you'll never be able to train it properly. Always make the dog walk behind you, when it's on a leash, no exceptions. So I guess I can assume that isn't true. I mean, proper leash training will result in a dog that walks to your side or slightly behind. That can be achieved through positive reinforcement methods rather than through fear-based dominant methods that you see from proponents of alpha theory. Furthermore, the desire to have your dog politely walking next to you is not so much because you're afraid your dog won't think of you as alpha as much as it's a pain to be dragged everywhere in a constant game of tug of war. If you're looking for positive reinforcement websites, Dr. Ian Dunbar is a great option, as is Victoria Stilwell. I always liked my dog to walk in front of me and off to the side. Never had an issue with training her. Dogs walk in front of us because most have twice the legs and therefore take twice the steps. Dogs pull or resist against pressure because that's a shared biological response amongst most of us mammals. If we are being restrained, we naturally resist by pulling away or moving in the opposite direction. Walking on a leash is not innate. We have to teach our dogs to walk on a leash the way we intend it for. Loose leash walking exercises and leash pressure exercises are key to achieving this. Also not true, if we look our dogs in the eye and they hold their gaze with us for more than several seconds, they don't respect us. If they look away, they are submissive to us which is what we want. Can confirm, a complete crock of shit. Our dogs look at us because they, like us, reply on that visual information to interpret the situation. They are studying our body language and trying to determine patterns, associations etc. We want our dogs to look at us in the eye for long periods of time, because if they are that focused on us, they are less likely to be distracted. Source, I'm a positive reinforcement trainer. My dog has always walked slightly in front of us. She tends to zigzag a little bit, because she's constantly sniffing and looking out for stuff. She always looks back as well, to make sure everyone's still there. We've never had a problem with training her, and we are lucky that she's oblivious to other dogs. To the point where dogs could literally be sniffing her face and she'll just carry on walking without so much as looking at them. Very dependent on the dog obviously. We probably got lucky with ours that she's quite docile and is very loving. There is quite a range when it comes to what dogs find valuable. I've worked with dogs who absolutely go bonkers when they see another dog and want nothing more than to interact with them. I've worked with dogs who absolutely go bonkers about encountering people on their walks, but could care less about other dogs. I've worked with dogs who, 
for as long as you are carrying their ball, will only focus on you and that ball. I've also worked with dogs like yours who are more environmentally motivated and find value in working their environment with their noses. And of course, many, many dogs are a little of all of these strays. Point is, it's important to recognize how your dog prioritizes value and use that information when training. Dogs sniffing the ground or working tend to keep a pace in front of us. Dogs who are focused on the ball tend to be by our sides more etc etc. Also, on a side note, I was just laughing yesterday at how much one of my three dogs has a zigzag in her walk as well, since she is always sniffing off to the side. It's super cute, and I was finally able to record it, so people can see what I mean when I explain this behavior. I'm sorry but that statement about looking into the eyes of a dog or most animals being totally fine is not correct. I used to wonder if that myth was true or not so during some of my internships I did with veterinarians I asked about this. Every single one answered that a lot of animals do feel intimidated when someone looks them straight in the eyes. I scrolled fairly far down and did not see what came to mind for me. A lot of people think blood is blue inside of the body and that it only appears red because of the oxygen or something in the air. I tried to explain this to a past coworker who was a former nurse and she wasn't having any of it. Turns out a lot of otherwise smart people believe that with no evidence, but blood is always red just darker at some points of circulation in the body. And it's very easily disproved too. I'm a phlebotomist, and we draw blood into evacuated, vacuum, tubes. There's very very little air in them, and the blood is still red. I had to argue this with a friend of mine. A friend who has two degrees in chemistry, an actual literal scientist. Myths are horribly pervasive. Critical thinking unfortunately is not. I remember this one. My favorite part is when they say blood turns red when you bleed because it absorbs oxygen from the air and changes color. That's why bruises are purple, but if you cut a bruise you bleed red. If blood just sucks up oxygen from contacting the atmosphere, lungs sure do have a lot of unnecessary moving parts. Edit, there's some science getting laid on me here. Thanks. If blood just sucks up oxygen from contacting the atmosphere, lungs sure do have a lot of unnecessary moving parts. I guess if we had like an open reservoir of blood, then we wouldn't need lungs. We can't do that, so the reason lungs have so much going on is that we can't just expose out blood to the atmosphere, we need to get it close enough to air to pick up oxygen, while still keeping it contained in our circulatory system. Hemoglobin does actually pick up oxygen pretty fast. That being in a cold place causes common cold. Edit, yes, I know that being in a cold place makes your immune system weaker, and because of that it's easier to get sick, but that wasn't the thing I was trying to say. I've been trying to convince my mother for 30 years that going to bed with wet hair will not make you wake up with a cold. She will believe it to the grave. I much prefer colder temperatures and I used to open my bedroom window at night in the winter so that I could sleep better. But my mum hated this and constantly insisted that I would get sick. It wouldn't be open if I was cold mum. It actually is proven that lot of people do sleep better with colder temperature so you go. All of the 60 year olds I know are obsessed with backquote drafts it's not the cold that gives you viruses, it's the backquote drafts from the open window. I met my little baby in a bassinet close to the floor and apparently I would give her an ear infection because she was too close to the floor too close to the drafts. I do the same. I absolutely cannot stand being hot. I love the cold months, typically the ass end of autumn to the majority, at least here, of spring. People have had to bring sweaters or blankets to my apartment when they wanted to hang out because I flat out refused to turn on the heater. Not my fault I can walk around in 30 degree weather, minus one for metric users, in shorts and a t-shirt. The most people only use 10% of their brain's capacity thing. Utterly ridiculous. The brain is a giant, metabolically expensive, staggeringly complex structure. Why on earth would our bodies grow something like that and then not use it? Edit. A lot of people in this thread have some very strange ideas about brains. Yes, if all your neurons fire at once that would be extremely bad. The thing to bear in mind is that different areas and structures of the brain are highly specialized for certain tasks. Talking about an overall brain capacity is misleading. There are no unused areas of the brain. 
You're almost certainly right, but it just makes me think of my friend that bought a £2,500 MacBook and only uses it for word and web browsing. Don't worry, that just means that it's tiny. Now, nah, size has little to do with intellect. Mostly means their brain is smooth as a grape. It's the main plot point in the movie Lucy with Scarlett Johansson. Watching Morgan Freeman using this as a scientific explanation for her superpowers was cringe-inducing. That cow is giving milk, because that's how this animal work. They don't believe me when I'm telling them that she needs to have baby to start producing milk. Yeah, I didn't realize cow's milk is literally just breast milk for baby cows until I was an adult. It's sad as fuck they have to continually get impregnated over and over again. What a life. Check out Dairy is scary on YouTube. Don't forget they have their calves taken away from them too. My sister won't have dairy for this reason, even though she's not vegan. True. It's honestly crazy what our society has normalized. I really spent so much of my life not thinking about industrialized animal agriculture, but umph once you start reading about it, it's downright dismal. I cannot wait for cloned lab-grown animal proteins. Gonna be a lot of ways a descendants see us as a bunch of old savages. That's how you know progress is happening. We are also going to have to explain how before third printed organ replacements we had to use cadavers like grab bags lol. If even a tenth of the food science dollars that went into making people crave Doritas went into meat substitutes, people wouldn't even care about what burgers were made of.